You're listening to Big World Network. Subprime Evil, Episode 6, Scavenger Hunt. Written by Robert S. C. Cutler. Read by Ryan Jones. Although there is no material subject matter within that couldn't be found in any general bookstore with no age constraint, this series is rated 18 and contains adult situations and content. Every once in a while, Tragedy would blur the beauty of the Arkansas and Little Arkansas rivers and their powerful currents, resulting in death for unsuspecting or weak swimmers. Both rivers were a focal point and a source of pride for Wichita, accenting the surprisingly cosmopolitan Midwestern city with its rich cultural centers and world-class museums. In the past couple of weeks, however, there had been at least three reports of people being dragged under by the strong undercurrents after falling into the river, or, by unofficial accounts, dragged into the dark waters by something else entirely. A team of scuba divers, search and rescue personnel, and forensic investigators combed the bottom of the Little Arkansas River as well as its banks. The park had been officially closed until further notice. Since the search of the main Arkansas River between Douglas and Lincoln hadn't turned up a body, the efforts were concentrated on the Little Arkansas River instead where the remains, presumed to be that of the homeless man James, had been discovered. Multiple plastic water bottles, pop bottles, and beer cans had been recovered. Under the bridge, a sleeper sofa missing its seat cushions rested just below the surface of the water. Even the rusted door of a car was lying on the silt-covered bottom of the river. But so far, not a trace of any more bodies. Just before the search party's supervisor called it a day, one of the drivers became entangled in the branches of a fallen tree. As he tried to pull free, the diver pushed hard against what he assumed was a large rock below him, but felt the mass shift. He submerged his head, trying to clear away the cloud of silt brought forth by his struggling so that he could better assess the situation. The driver could clearly see the branches of the tree where his foot was caught, but not the mass below it. As he pulled his leg free, Bits and pieces of bark and branches scattered beneath him, including something else as the unknown mass shifted further. The resulting murky cloud caused the diver to become disoriented as he struggled to return to the surface. While trying to swim up or at least away from the debris, something heavy hit his head, dislodging his respirator and became caught in his headgear. A partially decomposed human forearm was attached to the diver's mask by three bony fingers. The diver screamed, filling his lungs with water as his hands sunk deep into the mushy flesh, stripping it away from the bone in his failed attempts to pull it off as he sunk slowly to the bottom of the river. Gator emerged from the bedroom at four in the afternoon. His hair was slanted to one side and his eyes were barely open. He tried to push the image of the man in the fatigue jacket being dragged into the river out of his head, but the instant replay wouldn't stop. Nightmares of creatures with glowing eyes, clawing and biting, invaded Gator's dreams throughout the night and day. Even though he had at least 14 hours of sleep, he felt as if he had been awake for more than 24. Staring vacantly at the inside of the refrigerator, he removed the last of his energy drinks, popped the top, and took a big gulp. He made his way over to the couch and plopped down next to his cell phone, which had been sitting on an end table since that morning. Sergeant Pope had called no less than ten times throughout the day. What do you want? I called in sick, Gator complained to the phone. Pope had left a text at 9 a.m. and one at 2.30 p.m. Both stated that Gator better get his ass down to the precinct if he knew what was good for him. Gator fumbled at the buttons of his phone. Sick, he replied. Sorry, I missed all your calls. He pressed send and collapsed back against the couch cushions. Less than a minute later, the phone rang. He groaned and pressed the device to his ear. Hello? Is this Officer Davis? Pope queried. Sergeant Pope? Where have you been all day, Gator? The lieutenant wants your ass for the stunt you pulled last night. Stunt? Don't play cute with me, son, Pope growled through the receiver. We know it was you that called in that drowning last night. 911 captured your cell number, you moron. Oh, that. 
I can explain. I didn't mean to. And you won't ever again. Your job assignment is changing. You're to report to traffic control tomorrow night. Gator sat up and opened his eyes. I get to ride patrol? No, dumbass. You'll be working traffic cam. Claire walked through the door of the apartment and found Gator lying on the couch with his phone in his hand. Are you still sick, sweetie? No, just angry. I'm sorry my parents are staying until Sunday, Claire said. It's not them, Gator sighed. Well, not entirely. I start swing shift tomorrow. Oh no, you mean you'll be working in the middle of the night? Three until midnight, Gator said, dropping the phone onto the floor. Claire sat down beside him on the couch. But we'll never see each other, Clem. Gator righted himself and attempted to fix his flattened hair. He wanted to tell Claire that it was his entire fault he was being put on second shift, but he didn't have the courage. If he just hadn't lied the night before to get away from his overbearing in-laws, he wouldn't have had witnessed that gruesome scene at the river. Maybe we should take your parents up on their offer and move back home. Claire whirled on her husband and gave him a big squeeze. No way! We've worked too hard for our independence. I love my mom and dad dearly, but only in short visits. Gator snorted. Or no visits at all. Claire laughed and kissed Gator's head. Whew, you need to take a shower and brush your teeth. Stinky? I would say so. Claire watched Gator stroll into the bathroom, then her bright smile faded as she looked around the room and imagined how lonely it would be without him there every night. Even though she couldn't stomach moving back to Indiana, she wasn't sure if she could survive barely ever seeing her husband either. Never one to be deterred, she took a deep breath and headed into the kitchen for a cup of coffee before her parents returned for dinner. Gator walked out of the bedroom, dressed and ready to go, to find Claire and her parents waiting in the living room. Jean looked his son-in-law over, then checked his watch. Abby sighed and patted her husband's leg. All freshened up? Claire asked Gator. Gator searched his pockets and looked around. Holy buckets, what did I do with my wallet? Nightstand, under your car keys, Claire smiled. It's nearly six, are we leaving soon? Jean whined. Yes, Daddy, Claire answered with a glare. Your father just gets antsy when he's hungry, Abby said. Claire felt a pin of frustration build up in her stomach. She snapped at Gator, still fetching his wallet and keys from the bedroom. Let's go, Clem, time to leave. Gator walked into the living room and felt the angry glares of Claire and her parents. He picked up his pace and headed for the door without a word. He wished he could call in sick to his in-laws just like he did to work today. Heading toward Old Town, the conversation was light and short. Claire was driving her parents' town car with them in the spacious back seat while Gator rode shotgun. Instead of taking the freeway, Claire decided to drive through town to give her folks something to talk about other than how hungry they were and how terrible the Kansas drivers were during rush hour. She headed east on Central, driving through the intersection with the colorful lighted columns, marking the entrances to the Delano and Riverside, and then drove down scenic McLean that wound its way next to the Arkansas River. Instead of continuing straight, Claire turned onto Seneca and toward Riverside Park. Gator sat forward in alarm. Where are you going? He asked, fidgeting in his seat. It's still light enough to see the park and the river. I thought my parents would enjoy it. A knot formed in Gator's stomach. He was losing his patience, a feeling he wasn't accustomed to. Can we do this another time? I heard the park was closed right now anyway. Your dad is very hungry and I don't think we should wait to eat. Calm down, silly. It's just a short detour, and we can drive past the river even if we can't go all the way through the park. We'll get there, I promise, Claire said. Ignoring her husband's pleas, Claire turned toward the same area of the park where Gator had seen the man in the fatigue jacket dragged into the river the night before. The riverbank adjacent to the bridge was illuminated by no less than four portable floodlights. Several police cruisers with their lights flashing and one black coroner's van were partially blocking the traffic circle. As the town car approached, Claire was asked to pull over. Gator put his face in his hands. I really wish you would have listened to me, Claire. I thought we were going to eat, Jean protested from the back seat. Please, Daddy, let Clem talk to the police officer and we'll be on our way in no time, Claire said as she rolled down Gator's window and pointed the approaching officer her husband's way. Do you know him, sweetie? Gator slumped down in his seat. The approaching officer shined his flashlight into the car and then directly at Gator and smiled. Holy crap, is that you, Gator? I hate it when they call you that awful name, Claire said. The officer motioned for Gator to get out of the car. 
The lieutenant has been asking about you, and guess what? It's your lucky day, because he's standing right over there next to the pile of body parts. The officer pointed over to three officers decked out in their dress blue uniforms, standing next to a black tarp covering a mound three feet high. Claire covered her mouth. Oh my god. You better go on to dinner without me. I have a feeling I'll be a while, Gator said, and then get out of the car with his head down. Claire and her parents watched as Gator made his way down the slight incline toward the river's edge. He was met with a verbal assault from the three well-dressed officers. Claire's heart sank seeing her husband being so mistreated. What a pathetic example of a police officer, Jean scoffed from the back seat. He must embarrass his whole department. Claire felt like a fist tightened around her neck. Her jaw clenched with rage. That's enough, Daddy. You don't ever talk about my husband in that nasty manner again. Am I making myself clear? Jean started to respond, but was silenced by Abby. Don't, she said with a finger to her lips. Claire pulled around and headed back home. She bit her lip and her brows drew down. She wondered if her husband calling into work today had anything to do with the awful scene they had just witnessed. Her heart felt like it was beating out of her chest. She clenched to the steering wheel until her hands ached but she couldn't seem to let go. She drove all the way home, ignoring her father's hunger pains. He could starve for all she cared. She parked in front of the apartment complex, leaving her parents in the back seat without as much as a goodbye. She went straight for the bedroom, where she collapsed from frustration. An hour later, Claire received a call from Gator. Her spirits were lifted when she saw his name pop up on the caller ID. She answered excitedly, but his words stopped her breath. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Gator was being held on suspicion of murder, and he needed Jean's help in retaining a lawyer. Listening to Big World Network.